Well, welcome to Military Images Live. Going to hang on here for a minute or two and see who comes on board to join us this evening. I'm your host, Ron Coddington, the editor and publisher of Military Images. This is season one, episode 13. So uh, uh, I don't know how that adds up in the world of, um, uh, of seasons and number of episodes, but uh, we've been going strong um, with a couple of breaks in between. This is uh, the, um, uh, this is the uh, episode that we've just taken a three week hiatus while we had a lot of activity going on. Um, I can see Mike Werner is here. How you doing, Mike? Uh, Michael Pissarro is here. Doug and Fred, Rick Wolf. Hello, Rick. David Fry, hello. Folks are coming on board now. Thumbs up. Uh, Mr. Yunt is here, and I hope Dalton is along for the ride. Jeff, how you doing? Uh, good evening, Mr. York. Glad to see everybody. Glad to be back. It's been uh, a few weeks. Been in the uh, middle of publication, uh, actually the middle of production for our winter issue, which is uh, scheduled to hit the mailboxes at the end of this month. So uh, depending upon the holiday mails, you should have your issue sometime in December. And uh, while we are waiting for folks to sign on, I will tell you that uh, if you are not a subscriber, uh, now is a great time to become one. Or uh, if you've already got a subscription, if you know of someone who would like to uh, subscribe and you want to be kind to give them a gift subscription, you can do that too. So um, uh, if you get a chance, stop by militaryimagesmagazine.com for more information. And uh, hello from Manassas Manor. Very nice. Uh, here in Arlington, it is rainy and cold this evening. So let's start. Let's get started. Uh, I thought I would start out tonight, and uh, maybe we can have a show of hands here for all of you. Maybe this hand is easier. Show of hands for all of you that have uh, been engaged in researching uh, someone from the Civil War period. Show of hands. I know that I've done my share over the years, and I'll bet you have too. And um, as you're researching, you know, finding letters, diaries, um, personal information can be a real challenge. And when you do find it, that can be really quite rewarding. Um, what I'm always fascinated in is to find individuals who have written something that gives us a larger sense of the world, a larger sense of their Civil War experience. And as those of you who do research know, that can be really rare to find. Who is that person who is able to step outside themselves and take a look at what's going on around them? Uh, I found one such person uh, in the last week, and um, uh, she is not a soldier. Here she is. Her name is uh, Almira Fitch Quinby, and um, she's from Maine, uh, up in the Portland area. And um, uh, her, some of her letters were reproduced in a book that was uh, printed. It's a family history book that was printed in the late 1800s. Uh, those letters are fairly routine. They talk about um, getting boxes of apples delivered from Maine to the hospital where she was working in Annapolis, uh, various sites around Annapolis and the hospitals in which she worked. However, there's another cache of her letters, just a few of them, that are held at Columbia University in, of all places, their Health Sciences Library. I assume that's because she was a nurse. In one of those letters is just a wonderful quote that I want to share with you tonight. And here it is. And she says, and this is written in November of 1864. She says, we live a strange life. It's impossible to describe it as much like a rapidly moving panorama of tragedy and comedy combined as anything I can liken it to. We were told that we should never smile again after we entered the hospital. But strange to say, I have laughed more in the time than I ever did before. We laugh and cry alternatively. It's a nice quote, interesting observation 
from someone who was living the war through the perspective of a nurse. I really like what she says about a rapidly moving panorama of tragedy and comedy combined. I think that gives us a sense of the topsy-turvy world that they are living in. Think of the patients that she was seeing, the wounded and injured uh, soldiers and sailors that were coming into the hospital in Annapolis. Really pretty powerful stuff. So um, that bit of information makes me think of, while we're on the subject of research, I thought I'd share with you probably one of my, uh, my favorite stories. And um, it happened about five years ago when I was reaching, uh, researching, excuse me, um, a soldier in the 124th New York Infantry um, by the name of Isaac Nichol. Um, uh, the, one of the orange blossoms, if you know that nickname for the 124th. And uh, um, uh, his story, Nichols' story, is quite interesting. Um, he is in the uh, Hawks Ridge Devil's Den area. Those of you know, who know the battle know that area by the triangular field where Confederates um, came through that field and basically um, uh, ran amok all over those uh, Union soldiers. Uh, those Union soldiers put up a, a, a tough defense and uh, some folks credit the work there that they did with slowing down the Confederates just long enough to organize the uh, resistance up on Little Round Top. Anyway, uh, and Nickel was uh, left out on the battlefield and um, some soldiers, some Georgian soldiers, um, picked the Bible out of his pocket and um, took it away as a souvenir. On the way home, uh, after the battle was over, they stopped in a farmhouse in Pennsylvania and they took the Bible out. And according to the woman of the house, sort of the first time they had really given it a look. And as they were going through the pages, they found a passage in there where he asks that if something should happen to him, it's a classic line, right? If something should happen to me, I want you to return the Bible, in this case, to my family. So the woman of the house offers uh, the Georgian, to the Georgian soldiers, she says, hey, give me the Bible, I'll make sure it gets in the mail, and you all have done your duty. Of course, they readily agree, they want to do the right thing, so they turn the Bible over, and um, she sends it home. I wrote about uh, his story, and it appeared in Disunion, the New York Times blog, five years ago, in 2013. One of the comments that I received uh, on that blog post was from a woman named Stephanie, excuse me, uh, Stephanie Nicole Riley. Um, she's an ancestor of, uh, um, of the gentleman pictured here, Isaac. And um, she said, hey, I read your story with great interest. Uh, and um, I note in the story that you mentioned the Bible. And she says, I think I can help you um, finding that Bible. Of course, I would assumed it was long lost and looked all over the place for it. Um, but as it turns out, her father, John Nichol, actually had the Bible. And uh, this is where we get to one of the most fascinating, memorable moments of my work researching is um, I received a bunch of photographs uh, in the email, um, including this one here, which you can see shows the Bible and the flag in which it was wrapped. Um, and the family has kept it for this entire time. And um, here's a view inside showing um, one of the pages of that Bible. So as you can see, um, pretty impressive stuff. Um, I talked on the phone with John Nickel, and uh, John's passion for his ancestor was tremendous. John was uh, in his, uh, I think, late 70s at the time. And um, I loved the passion of the man. I loved John's description of his ancestor and all he had learned about uh, Isaac Nichol. So I was deeply saddened um, when I learned this week, I got another email from Stephanie telling me that John had passed. And so uh, I want to um, let everybody know um, that uh, in the passing of John Nichol, we lost uh, someone who had an intense feeling about his Civil War ancestor and had worked hard to preserve his memory and to preserve all of his relics, including that Bible. So a really touching and, and moving story. Um, I'm sorry again uh, to get the news about John and wanted to remember him uh, tonight to all of you. 
Um, I'm assuming you've never had a chance to meet him, but he was a wonderful, wonderful guy and he will be missed by his family and by me. Um, we had a couple of phone calls since that time. So uh, speaking of families and family information, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I drove down to Fredericksburg, uh, Virginia, which uh, is actually not a long drive, but if you're driving down Interstate 95, uh, anything can happen. Uh, traffic, all that kind of stuff. So I uh, made it down uh, to Fredericksburg where I was meeting uh, Joe and Mir Myrna Cagnini. Um, the Cagninis have lived in Fredericksburg for a long, long time. Joe is a retired detective. And um, when he was finished with his uh, work as a police officer, when he retired, he put his detective work uh, into family genealogy. And um, uh, one of his projects was researching Myrna's family. And they tracked uh, up through Ohio and then after the war out west to Nebraska. And uh, the reason I got this call from, uh, um, uh, from Joe was uh, about a photograph that he had, a family photograph that was connected to another project that I was working on uh, about the Medal of Honor. And uh, uh, I've got a photograph, I've got a copy of that photograph to share with you now. Um, this is a family photo. There you go. All right. Um, we have uh, this image and um, uh, soldier's first name is Isaac and uh, last name Pierce, spelled P-E-I-R-C-E, -E, 2nd Ohio Cavalry. This is just an absolutely pristine condition albumin. And um, I really got a laugh because for all of us who collect photographs, if you're like me, you take great pains to put them in archival material and you take care of them with your life and they're all carefully stowed away. And um, uh, because you know that they're valuable and you know you're a caretaker and uh, all of that, um, all the good things that we do as students. Uh, Joe and Myrna, uh, not, really sh not really understanding the value of them, um, had this image of Isaac laying in a plastic box, um, uh, unwrapped, un 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 unattended. And um, so one of the things I did, one of the first things I said is, hey, you probably want to get an archival sleeve uh, to protect this um, because it probably has got some good value. And it does. Uh, aside from being an absolutely pristine condition albumin portrait with uh, an, a wonderful inscription on the back um, that details a little bit of uh, Isaac Pierce's uh, record, um, it also, you also come to find out that there was a bunch of other photos in that plastic box, including a copy of uh, a daguerreotype um, of the family, showing Isaac uh, on the left with his two sisters, and um, a really interesting photograph of um, right here of uh, this horse. It's a Mustang. Ah, technical problems. Uh, this is a um, uh, photograph of um, a Mustang a Plains Mustang, uh, and the Mustang, the name of the Mustang is uh, Pony Mac. And um, this was actually purchased from uh, uh, Native Americans, from Indians um, in Kansas, because the Ohio horses were basically not really adapting well to the weather out there uh, and to the food. And so the soldiers began investing or trading, however they got them, um, into animals from that part of the country. So um, long story short, uh, um, Isaac is uh, killed in a little tiny battle called Abraham's Creek. And um, uh, after that battle, it's in Virginia. And um, after that battle, uh, uh, his sword, his revolver, uh, and Pony Mac actually make it home to Ohio and uh, lives a long life up there. And so um, uh, this image and the other images are going to appear in the next issue of the magazine. And um, what I find interesting about all of this is the next issue, uh, the story um, of Isaac Pierce is actually part of a larger story. And that larger story is about honor. Uh, and the story is about the Medal of Honor. And as many of you may know, the Medal of Honor 
uh, becomes, uh, is awarded regularly um, during the war. And um, although many are awarded, the actual, and the criteria is established, the actual verification of the medals at that time are, uh, let's say they're, they're not particularly um, well researched when the awards are made. That leads in the early 1900s to a very thorough review of who all received the medals, and then a large number of the medals that were awarded during the war are withdrawn. So Isaac Pierce, uh, his story has a role in honor. Um, he's someone actually, as you'll find out, did not receive the Medal of Honor, but his story is wrapped up in a story of someone else who did. Another story that's part of the question of honor is this man. You can see him right here. Um, this is Mark Fernald Wentworth, and um, he was a, a colonel in two main regiments. And uh, for those of you who know Medal of Honor history and know Maine, I won't give you the number, but you probably know what regiment I'm talking about. And you know about the medals that were awarded to the entire regiment and how a number of them were taken away. Um, Wentworth has uh, a largely unrecognized role in all of this. And uh, so we're going to talk about that in the next magazine, the next issue of the magazine. And what you're looking at here, this image of Wentworth, uh, we believe has never before been published. Um, it's the only known military, or I should say, wartime view of Wentworth in uniform. So you'll read all about him and his contribution to helping us um, really fulfill the mission of the Medal of Honor, what it was really supposed to be all about. So I'm going to move on here. I want to take a look at some, uh, some other images uh, that we're working on. One of the uh, uh, stories for the issue uh, coming up is uh, the second installment of Lookout Mountain. And um, this gallery that we're doing is called Portraits on the Point. And uh, it's a collection of images that we've spent more than a year trying to track down. Um, it has an introduction by Anthony Hodges, who was a notable collector. And um, there's a couple of images I just want to show you here. Um, that you'll be seeing. One of them is, uh, is this one here. Some of you may have seen this before. Uh, if you look closely at the two gray-coated men um, sitting on top of uh, what is known as Roper Rock for a gentleman uh, photographer who fell to his death from the rock, you'll also uh, notice that those men are Confederate soldiers. And uh, to date, this is the only image that we've been able to find of Confederates who are posed on Lookout Mountain. If you have one, I would love to know about it. It's not too late. We're going to the printer in about a week and a half, two weeks, and so there's time. So if you find uh, an image of Confederates on Lookout Mountain, do let me know. Uh, so another image I wanna show you, and the bulk of images, 99% of them, are of Union soldiers. Here's one um, of two members of the 15th Pennsylvania Cavalry. And I want to tell you, uh, first off, that uh, uh, a number of images show someone on top of the mountain invariably pointing in some direction. It's usually out towards the other side of the ridge where the Confederates were or where the Union soldiers came through. It could be pointing towards the town of Chattanooga. But this one is unusual because the gentleman uh, at the edge of the rock Look, if you can just see, his finger is pointing at the camera. That's great. I, I haven't seen one of those before. And the camera operators in this case would have been one of the Lynn brothers, uh, uh, Royan um, or James. So uh, I should say Royan is also known as Robert. Uh, one of the Lynn brothers were up on Lookout Mountain or one of their assistants. And this soldier was actually pointing at them. So it's a great little detail. And uh, whoever, uh, the, the owner of this uh, image, uh, liked it so much that in 1876, a painting was commissioned of this image. And so we also have that. Here's a great uh, oil painting, which, as you can see, is based on the photograph, literally uh, copied exactly from the photo. So you'll see these and um, a number of other images that uh, are featured in the next issue. Of the magazine. Speaking of unusual images, 
Uh, here's one that I, I honestly have never seen before. And um, this appears in a gallery that we're calling Jerseymen, which is a collection of New Jersey soldiers from the collection of John Cool. John spent a lifetime, 50 years, uh, 60 years collecting, uh, shared with me a bunch of images from his collection. And um, a number of them really grabbed uh, my attention, especially this one. All right. Now, if you know uniforms, you're wondering what in the heck is going on here? Um, uh, have you ever seen this? Any guesses? Uh, let me see, no guesses out there. So I'm gonna go ahead and tell you. Um, this is a soldier um, from the 3rd New Jersey Cavalry. Uh, they were nicknamed the Butterflies and um, really distinctive uniforms following the, oh, 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 we're having some technical issues here again. Um, there you go. Um, there you go. Following the early style uh, that you'll see in uh, sort of the, the 1600s, 1700s, uh, the wonderful um, uh, imagery with the three rows of buttons, the sideways hats, all that good stuff. These guys also had a cap pardon me, a cape that they wore. And this soldier is wearing the cape that you can see is actually shown as he would have worn it if it was a rainy or inclement day. So the cape, which we usually see in these images, is folded over the back of the soldiers and it's barely visible. Here we see the cape and it's the way it was fully intended to be. So it's, it's fastened, you can see three, um, three fasteners across the top which appear to be buttoning over the chest. And then there's a full hood uh, that comes down and it's a roomy hood, which leaves the ability to hold his cap. So he can wear his big cap and he can wear that hood on top of it. So uh, this is definitely one of the super rare images. And if you're a uniform enthusiast, I think you'll find it quite fascinating. Uh, the moment I saw it, the first thing I thought is um, imagine a group of these cavalrymen riding through New Jersey, uh, pardon me, riding through Virginia on a rainy day with all of these uh, these light blue capes on. It must have been pretty powerful, uh, a pretty interesting and unusual look as they were riding down a dirt road. Here's an image that's a little bit less obvious that you may find uh, of interest. And uh, this one comes from Steve Carnes. And uh, the reason that he sent it to me was to point out what's going on over here. Take a look at this side of the image. And just to give you a little bit of context, behind him is a very plain canvas backdrop. It's fairly routine, fairly common looking. There's no surprises in that canvas backdrop. You can see it's um, laying uh, against a wall. It's probably attached with some hooks along the top and um, it falls a little bit short of the floor by maybe about four inches or so. It goes up into the corner and this area in white along the side you can see here and there's a bit of a brown edge around it. Um, it's not exactly white. If you look closely, you'll see a little bit of the pattern in it. And what it really is, is a reflecting board. And these reflecting boards were used by photographers in their galleries so that they could shine light, they could reflect light um, to be able to increase the light in the room. So in these days before electricity, many of these photographers used a, um, they had a skylight in their studio. Um, they really wanted to get as much light coming in as possible. So one of the techniques that they use is this reflecting board. I've never seen one before in a CDV. But then again, or, or a hard plate image, but then again, I can't say that I've actually looked. I, I, when it was pointed out to me, I thought, oh, that's really fascinating. So the next time you're looking through your collection uh, and uh, you see uh, a canvas backdrop and there's more to be seen around that canvas backdrop, take a look and see if you can find the reflecting board, which is gonna be a very light color and it has little indentations in it to reflect that light so that the subject of the photograph can be um, better lit. And as you can see here, it actually seems to have worked because there's some great backlighting going on here plus some front lighting. So it's pretty clear to me that this photographer was definitely a professional. 
So a couple more items to go through with you here. Um, this is a little bit of a scary story. Uh, and um, okay, uh, this image um, comes from a John, whoop, John Fulton in Bigler, Biglerville, um, Pennsylvania. Um, he purchased this image of uh, some GAR veterans. And um, his question to me, and I'm not sure if you guys can even see this, but his question to me was, right up here, there's some spots that are forming um, above this gentleman on his shoulder and close to his face. They're round dots, they're very tiny, and um, they almost look like a piece of acid or something was dropped on, um, uh, on the photo and has created a little bit of damage. Now, uh, he recently, John recently purchased this photo, and when he got the photo, those little um, three dots were not, weren't there. Um, and um, he had it stored in a safe place. There seemed to be no issues with it. And yet, um, these dots started to form. So if you've had any uh, images that have had this kind of issue, definitely um, let us know, because I'm curious to find out more about what might have been causing something like this. I recommended him to a conservation center to try to get some more information. And um, uh, if it's true, if it's damage that's spreading, then there's steps that will have to be taken to try to preserve it. So two more items before we wrap up this evening. Uh, one of them is a conversation that I had uh, in Gettysburg uh, recently with uh, Doug York and uh, Brennan Thompson. Uh, Doug hosted us uh, and his wonderful family, Darlene and his children. Um, uh, and uh, we had a wonderful time sitting around talking. One of the things that we talked about was the old days of collecting, the pre-digital age. And um, I told some of the stories about uh, mail order catalogs. And I'm sure a number of you that are tuning in have great stories to tell about them too. Um, I often like to tell the story of the Henry Deeks catalog that had a 5 a.m. call-in time um, for those hardy souls that wanted to get an image really badly to add to their collection. A far cry from uh, um, uh, uh, Civil War Faces Marketplace and um, other sites that you can go to to purchase images instantly. Uh, so my first mail order catalog was not a Civil War photo catalog. It was a catalog of old newspapers. And um, it was uh, filled with Harper's Weeklies, uh, Leslie Weeklies, uh, New York Times, other newspapers from the 1700s to the 1800s that were for sale. Um, that catalog, uh, the owner of the catalog was Timothy Hughes. And um, I first started getting it in the mail back in 1978. <coughs> that was a little while ago. Uh, so uh, Tim Hughes, I made a number of purchases through Tim's and was always a happy customer. Lo and behold, how many years later, 40 years later, Tim is still publishing his catalog. And here it is. Um, it's, to my knowledge, it's the last catalog that's left, uh, that's out there. I still get it. We're on issue number, let's see here. Uh, oh, sorry, this is catalog 276. So for 40 years and probably longer, Tim has been publishing this. And um, it's exactly the same as it always has been on a sort of a yellow manila paper. It comes folded in half. It's got his tra trademark logo on it. So if you are interested uh, in old newspapers, I highly recommend you go find Timothy Hughes. They've got a website uh, and they're doing great stuff online. So don't get the idea that these guys are stuck in old school land. They're completely, they got a website, great customer service and uh, plenty to offer. So um, if you want to go check out Tim Hughes and find yourself an old newspaper. If you don't find it on their site, you can contact Tim and they'll track it down for you if they, can, if they have it in stock. So uh, one other advertising note, um, we have a new advertiser that has joined the magazine. Um, this is Brendan Cinnamon and Bill Cinnamon of the Union Drummer Boy in Gettysburg. Many of you know uh, the Union Drummer Boy. Uh, they're great, they do fantastic um, work uh, in their store. They've been around for a long time and uh, among the best known and best reputable in the business. So I'm absolutely delighted that they have joined our team um, uh, and have trusted their advertising with military images. Um, we know that the support of the magazine is based upon not only you, the subscribers, but also the support of our advertisers. So big, big thank you and a shout out to Union Drummer Boy and a big shout out to you um, for tuning in 
and hanging out with us this evening. I'm going to shut it down for now and I uh, wish you all a great rest of the week. And um, we'll be back with a new episode next week. So let us know what's going on if you want us to look up stuff for you. Uh, or if you have any questions about photography, give me a buzz. Take care. Have a great night. Bye.